Excellent. So we're in really for a treat. I, I saw Bill perform earlier this week in town of introduce him. Bill is a computer scientist actually and has worked in research and taught most of his life. Uh, most recently doing genetics research at the Brew Institute in oh, oh, no. Cambridge. Okay. The president will be expressing his concerns about American democracy, his concerns in 1790, and how those concerns echo today. This speech contains part of a larger presentation that Bill does in schools. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you, Bill Lewis. Thank you so terribly much. It's the great honor and pleasure to be here. Since my demise, this is the first time that I have even been in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And of course, the first time I have been ever been here at the house of my Secretary of War, Mr. William St. Eustace. Now, you may be curious as to the cause for my return after 180 years of quiet repose in the grave. <laughs> and which is precisely the type of little witticism that James Madison was famous for. But I am concerned about the future of my country. I have seen things happen that we warned against in my day, we fought against in my day, and yet I have seen these come back to this country in a way that, that, that scares me, that frightens me. And so I thought that perhaps if I returned now with the able assistance of Mr. Bill Lewis, that I could talk about how we faced our issues and what they were, that you might learn from them and make better choices for your future. <clears throat> After all, this is not my country anymore. It is your country, and it is the country of your children. This being my first visit to Boston, and I am so pleased to be able to come to this lovely mansion of uh, my Secretary of War, William Eustace. He was a good man, and he served his country well. Indeed, he served his state well. I know that he was a very popular governor. What greater love can a man have than to devote himself to the well-being of his country, his commonwealth, and to serve it unto his dying breath, as did William Eustace? a good and well-loved man. I have often been criticized for my choice of Governor Eustace as my Secretary of War, and I should like to speak to this issue. Looking back on a situation, Premier Library, snug in a warm leather chair, fire crackling in the fireplace, surrounded by your books, and reading only one person's interpretation of the time, and thinking about only one issue, how well did the War Department run? One loses some of the nuance that comes when dealing with actual human beings and actual politics. At the time, in 1809, I was not particularly worried about how well the War Department ran. I was concerned about maintaining my country as a country. I need not remind you that <coughs> you from New England had a conference in 1814 to discuss leaving the Union. I was far less concerned about the Secretary of War than I was about maintaining the Union. One might say, if only Madison had chosen a better person, a more forceful person to be Secretary of War, that everything would have been fine. But of course, that is never the way things are. I needed a man who was capable, who was loyal, who saw the world as I saw it, who was dedicated to a Republican form of government, and who was from the North. We needed representation from the North in the cabinet. It was essential, or this country might have fallen apart. 
William Eustace was the man. And I'm eternally grateful for him standing up, doing things which were very difficult for him. He is not primarily a military man, as I'm sure you know. As a surgeon, of course, he attended to the Battle of Bunker Hill. He was in charge of the hospitals afterwards. He did a superb job. But he was not a general here, not a military man. And having to deal with the forceful nature of his general, Hampton and Wilkinson, I do pity him. He did a very reasonable job under very unreasonable circumstances. <laughs> One thing he did do, being a good intellectual, he very cleverly had the manuals of military preparation and training translated from French into English, which one would intellectually say is a very good idea. If one was not concerned about the generals who are responsible for the training of their troops and might resent the interference of someone coming up with a new manual without even asking of them. So, uh, Mr. Eustace did not have a great deal of support from the generals. <coughs> and, of course, we didn't really have an army. The plan was to have the militias take responsibility for defending the country when invaded. That was a great idea and did not work very well. It seems that gentlemen, no matter how noble they might be, who come and practice they're soldiering in the common for a weekend. They learn to march with their muskets. They learn to fire accurately. They learn to stand in lines. And then they retire to the pub for a good drink afterwards to talk about their implied courage and bravery. These men, however wonderful they are, do not make the best of soldiers. And when compared to the military of Britain, Men who have trained together for years, who have been in a hundred battles with Napoleon, they are far better soldiers than what we had. And Mr. Eustace took much of the blame for this, I am sorry to say. He did not deserve that. So in December of 1812, I fired him <laughs> as Secretary of War. That is the official story. The actual story is that I did not fire him, I transferred him to a different situation where he would be more productive. As ambassador to Holland, he sat in the center of Europe, the power of money in Europe, which is where we wanted him. And his skills allowed him to execute that position superbly. Indeed, he is responsible for the Treaty of Amsterdam, allowing our expanded commerce later in this century to be respected and admired by the Europeans. And, of course, upon his return from Holland in 1818, the citizens of Massachusetts elected them to their top office, where he was efficient, loved, and universally admired. Moreover, his wife, Carolyn, and my wife, Dolly, became good friends and wrote frequently. I believe that there is even a small portrait of Dolly here in the house. <laughs> so it's a great pleasure to be here. Talk among yourselves. <laughs> <laughs>